wonderful. Amen. Thank you, young people. All right, we're going to be in the book of Proverbs this morning. Turn over to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 24. While you're turning, I'll share a story with you. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you in here has got a crazy uncle? Raise your hand. Yeah. So my brother, when he was up visiting a few weeks ago, he told me a story. I had heard it years ago and forgot about it, and I've thought about it several times since then. My brother, my uncle worked in, a, in an auto parts store in a little place called Osceola, Georgia. And one day, an old farmer, old farmer came in there and said, I want to I wanna buy half of a 55-gallon drum. And my uncle said, well, we sell 55-gallon drums. We got those 55-gallon drum metal drums with a lid on it, like if you want to drain your oil or something. We got a few of them out back. Be glad to say, you said, no, I want to buy half a 55-gallon drum. My uncle said, well, we don't really sell them like that. You know, you buy the whole thing. You're welcome when you buy it. You cut it, cut it in half yourself. You use a saw or a torch and cut it in half, and then you'll have two. He said, no, I just want to buy half of it. He said, well, I'm going to talk to my boss. So my uncle turned around and walked back to the back of the store. They had those little plastic flap things hanging up there between the, the back counter and the, and, the, and the storeroom. So he walked through there and found the boss sitting back in the back. And what he didn't know was the guy had followed him back there. And he says to his boss, he said, you ain't going to believe this. He said, that's some half-wit, absolute, ignoramus idiot that's wanting to buy a half of a 55-gallon drum, and his boss was going like this. <laughs> and so he said, they got this half-wit, ignoramus, dummy, wanting to buy half a 55-gallon drum. He turns around, the guy's standing right there, and he put his arm around his shoulder. He said, and this distinguished gentleman wants to buy the other half. <laughs> well, that's funny right there. <laughs> That's quick thinking right there, buddy. <laughs> Proverbs 24, you there? Can you stand with me, please? We could have used a host of verses this morning, but we're going to use this one as our text and look at quite a few others throughout the message. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse number 16. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Yeah. Yeah. A just man falleth seven times, and riseth up again. I've got that underlined in my Bible. And uh, I got to working on a Western Sunday message, and I had a good time doing it. We're going to have fun preaching this this morning. And I hope it will help somebody. I want to preach on this thought. Get back in that saddle. Amen. Get back in that saddle. Lord, we pray that you'd help us now as we turn to the scriptures. May the word of God minister to our hearts. Lord, we're thankful for the singing we've heard. But Lord, now as we have preaching and preaching of the word, I pray that you would help me to be able to help somebody today. Is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Let's just be honest. Even the best get knocked out of the saddle sometimes. Yes, sir. There's no cowboy saying there never was a horse that couldn't be rode, never was a cowboy that couldn't be thrown. I, I have, as I've been looking at this verse, that word falleth here literally means to be cast down, to fall down, to be overthrown or to fall prostrate on the ground. That's what that word falleth means in our text. And as I begin to look at this verse, and I begin to think about this, this message, I realize that, you know, for Western Sunday, can we, can we borrow a few little Western analogies to make the message this morning? The significance of being in the saddle as opposed to being knocked out of the saddle, it's pretty simple. If you're in the saddle, that means you're going somewhere. If you're in the saddle, that means you're, you're making progress. If you're in the saddle, you're, you're doing a job, you're busy, something's happening. But if you've been knocked out of the saddle, it means you're not going anywhere. You know, Winston Churchill said this, no hour of life is wasted that is spent in the saddle. I'm just curious, 
How many of you in here have ridden horses? Raise your hand, ridden horses. How many of you, that's a pretty good crowd. How many of you have never ridden a horse in your life? Raise your hand. Oh my soul, we should have got some horses over here. <laughs> we should have got some horses over here, got them over in the soccer field. Could all could have got our video cameras out. And we would have had some, we'd had a good time with that right there. But when you get knocked out of the saddle, this is deep, now stay with me. When you, when you get thrown out of the saddle, you ain't going anywhere. All right, all progress has just stopped. If you've been knocked out of the saddle, you're not making your boss any money. If you've been knocked out of the saddle, you're probably, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say you're probably bruised and sore and hurting somewhere. Roy Rogers said when you're young and you fall off a horse, you may break something. When you're my age, you just splatter. I say amen to that. I remember one time we had horses before we came up here. Before God moved us to Dundalk, we had horses. Had four acres in Tigerville with a horse pasture and a barn, and we had some horses. Had a registered, had a registered Tennessee Walker. Her name was Cinnamon. Beautiful horse, amazing horse. We had several, several other horses, but that one was my favorite. And that's the one I enjoyed riding. They just have a natural, smooth gait. When you're riding some horses, you just feel like you're just getting beat to death. When you ride her, buddy, she was just smooth as butter. Remember Callie? Callie, Callie ride that horse all over the place. And uh, one day I went out there and I thought, I'm just going to ride the horse a little bit. So I got her out of the barn and uh, I got her, I got her bridle, bridle on her, I got her saddled. And, uh, but I didn't lunge her. I didn't warm her up. I just grabbed her cold turkey and put the saddle on her. And she, she was just a typical woman. I expected too much out of her without establishing a clear line of communication first, all right? And, and I got up on her, and when I got up on her, I saddled her, and I put my left foot in the stirrup, and I was, I was leaning over to put my right foot in the stirrup, and she, she just frog hopped. That's all she did was frog hop, which is not a problem if you're sitting upright on the horse. When you're leaning over to one side, that's a recipe for disaster. I leaned over to put my foot in the stirrup and she frog hopped. And when she did, I lost my balance and I grabbed a hole of the, of the, of the saddle horn. For those of y'all from Baltimore, that's not something you blow to get people out of, your, out of the way when you're in traffic, all right? It's a different kind of horn, all right? Saddle horn. I grabbed it and, the, and, and I started falling. I felt the saddle slipping and it started slipping. And I'm looking down. She frog hopped again. There was no chance of me recovering. And I looked down at the ground and it wasn't but about four or five feet away, but it looked like a mile off. And I fell off that horse, that saddle came around sideways, I landed on my side, and the first thing that came to my mind was, that ground's a lot harder than it used to be. That's the first thing that came to my mind. And then she started tap dancing on my head. She was trying to get that saddle off of her belly, which had done turned around, and she started jumping and frog hopping, knocked me out, I mean cold as a cucumber, everything just went black, and I'm laying there, and she's dancing up mud puddling me, and then she took off to running, and the stirrups was hitting her back of her legs, and the more she ran, the more scared she got, and she ran around that, 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 that pasture about four or five times, and I laid there, and I shook my head, and just like in the cartoons when you hear the birds chirping and you got the knot that grows up, all that. And I'm laying there and I got up on my knees and she ran around and finally she just ran up to the gate and she was just, she was just trembling, scared to death. I'm laying there trying to figure out what happened. She's laying there, she's standing there trying to figure out what happened. And my wife, my wife leans out the back door and she said, hey, supper's on the table. I said, y'all go ahead and eat. I gotta ride this horse. And I went up there to her. She was just shaking and trembling. I took that cinch loose and I got that saddle, saddle blanket back up on her. I saddled her up real good. I put a lead rope on her and I lunged her for a little while till she submitted, calmed down. And then I got up on that horse and I rode her for about 15 minutes. Because see, I learned something. When you, when you get bucked off, or you fall off, or you get thrown off, the quicker you can get back in the saddle, the better off you'll be. First of all, I didn't want her to learn a bad habit. I didn't want her to be standing there at that gate going two plus two equals four. 
I didn't want her to realize that the minute I reach over to put my foot in the stirrup, every time after that, she can lighten the load by frog hopping, which is exactly what she would have done. I read one time where a cowboy said, anybody that thinks a horse is dumb is dumb. I didn't want her to learn that she could get rid of me that easy. I'll tell you another reason why I did it. I didn't want to go back home and sit down at my table and start eating and thinking about how hard that ground was and forget how fun that saddle was. I didn't want to think about the pain and the hurt and, and, the, and the aggravation of laying on the ground and to, to the point to where I forget the joy of riding the horse. Here's where a lot of people are. They've been knocked out of the saddle. And a lot of them still laying on the ground. Need to get back in the saddle. Let's just be honest. And when you've been knocked out of the saddle, you've got a decision to make. You can either lay there and bleed or you can get up and dust yourself off and get back in the saddle. I'm gonna give you four reasons this morning by way of introduction on why we get knocked out of the saddle. Things that happen that cause us to get knocked out of the saddle. And then we're gonna look at some reasons why we need to get back in the saddle. Y'all with me? First of all, people get knocked out of the saddle because they've been toppled over by their foes. How many of you remember in those old cowboy movies, those old westerns where a cowboy would be riding up through a mountain pass, sitting up there on his horse, and an Indian or a bad guy, a bandit or a bank robber, jump off of one of those boulders and tackle them and grab them and knock them off their horse. How many of you seen that? Can I be honest with you? There's been a many times I've been knocked out of the saddle in a similar way. I've been blindsided by the enemy. Had no idea they were there. Had no idea they were lurking. Had no idea that they were waiting for me to come through there. And as soon as they did, jumped on me, knocked me out of the saddle. And I'm laying there trying to figure out what just happened. It's not fun. I've had the enemy come out of nowhere and knock me down a lot of times. I'm thinking about the times when you're minding your own business. The times when you're trying to serve the Lord. And people you didn't even know about people that you wasn't even thinking about could say or do something to hurt you so bad, knock the wind out of you. Can I get a witness? They've been toppled over by their foes. Secondly, some people get out of the saddle because they've been tuckered out by their feebleness. I thought about this. We've all seen those old cowboys where they literally fall out of the saddle due to exhaustion. I'm talking about bow-legged cowboys. They're so bow-legged, they couldn't hem a hog in a ditch. Been riding horses since they was little bitty things. They're more at home in a saddle than they are sitting in a rocking chair. But when you've been in that saddle for so long and you're out there and you don't get rest and you don't take care of yourself, you get to the point of exhaustion where even the best and most experienced can literally fall out of the saddle. Too many days on the trail too many miles without a break. Too many miles between water holes. I remember watching those old westerns where they would, they would ride through the deserts and you could just about, you'd just get thirsty watching it. Their face would be all caked up with sand and, and, you could, and it would show the sun and it would show the sun bearing down on them and you could just see them staggering through the, uh, through the, through the desert or through the mountains and then they'd get to a water hole and it'd be dry. Only thing worse than a dry water hole is a water hole full of water and it was poisoned. Remember that? And they couldn't drink it. And you just felt so sorry for them. The point I'm making is the best of men, the strongest of Christians, those that are experienced, those that know God and walk with God, if we're not careful, we can get so tired from the journey that if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves falling out of the saddle. There have been a lot of days I didn't think I could go on. There's been a lot of days all I want to do is lay down and take a nap. There's been a lot of days where I want to clock out and check out and say, you can have it. I've gone as far as I can go. But can I tell you something? We got to get back in the saddle. Amen. Number three, some people get knocked out of the saddle because they've been turned on by their friends. That's probably, that's probably as far as I'm concerned, one of the worst ones. When somebody that you think's on your side, somebody that you think's with you, 
a friend, an ally, somebody that you've leaned on, relied on. David said it like this in Psalm 41, verse number nine, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. I'm gonna have to be honest with you. I've had more times where I got knocked out of the saddle by my friends than I did by the world. You kind of see the world coming. You kind of brace for the world. The friends, the one beside you, the ones behind you. I used to hate it when they, when, when, when they would pull their gun out and point it at their friend and say, put your hands up. And that look of shock on their face. I didn't know you was one of the bad guys. I thought you was with us. But they was in on the scheme and they was, they, they done infiltrated the group and they was, they was with the bad guys and the next thing you know, their, their, their hands are tied and they're laying on the floor. I've been like that a time or two in my life. All of us have. If you've been in church, if you've been in ministry for any length of time, you know what it's like to get knocked out of the saddle by the friends. Abraham in the Bible watched his nephew Lot walk away and embrace Sodom and the life of Sodom over being with him. You know that had to hurt. David, in the Bible, he dodged javelins from Saul after loving Saul, the Bible says that David loved Saul. The Bible said he was his armor bearer. He fought his battles. The Bible says he was playing the harp, ministering to him, trying to be a blessing, and only to look up and see Saul, the man that he loved, throwing javelins at him, trying to pin him to the wall. How do you reckon Jesus felt in the Garden of Gethsemane Amen. when one of his own disciples walked up to him, kissed him on the cheek, said, my friend, master, and then turned around, looked at the gang behind him and said, there he is, betrayed by his own disciple. How do you reckon Paul the apostle felt when he said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world? As Paul's sitting in jail, as he's sitting there in that prison and as he's writing Timothy, he's thinking about all the people that's done him wrong and he thought talking about Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. You better watch out for him. Beware of him. He greatly withstood our words and right there in that sentence, in that paragraph, in that context of thinking about the coppersmith, he kind of threw Demas in there. He was my friend. He was my preacher boy. He's somebody I invested in, somebody I spent time with and he's done gone off and left me and it hurt. It hurt. That's why he said at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Number four, maybe they've been thrown out of the saddle by their flesh. Maybe, maybe their flesh got the best of them. I'm thinking about Samson. What a man, what a mighty man, strong man, amazing man. You know what Samson, he had a flesh problem. Yes. Yes, sir. When you read the story of Samson, it's heartbreaking because he does something amazing then he does something stupid. And then he does something absolutely amazing and he turns right around and does something stupid and that's how his whole life was. Right. The spirit of the Lord would come on him and he would do unbelievable things And then because of his flesh, his wicked heart and wicked desires, he found himself in a Philistine prison with his eyeballs gouged out. Do you reckon we might could say he got thrown? You better believe he did. And thrown off by their flesh. What about David? Mighty man. The leader of the mighty men. What about David? Man after God's own heart. One day stayed home from battle, took a nap, got some sleep, walked outside on his porch, on his balcony, looked over the rail and saw Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, bathing and immediately he got thrown out of the saddle. What about Peter? Standing around that fire. Just told the Lord, I'll go with you even unto the death. Just a few minutes later, just a few 
hour or two later, he's standing around that fire cursing, swearing, denying that he even knows the Lord. Can we say it? Can we say it? He got thrown out of the saddle by his flesh. Whatever your reasons for getting thrown out of the saddle is this morning, you got a decision to make. That's where I want to get to. What do you do when it happens? When you're laying there in the dirt and you're bleeding and you're sore and you're hurting and in your mind you're trying to relive what just happened. How did I get here? Sometimes it happens so fast it takes you a while to remember what happened. I've had things happen to me in my life and in my ministry. To this day, I still don't know what happened. If I get to talking about it, it hurts all over again. I don't even know what happened. People got upset with me. People walked away from me. People said things and did things to this day. I have no idea what they were thinking. I have no idea what brought it on. I have no idea what happened. When you get thrown, you've got a choice. You can lay there in the dirt and you can bleed and you can relive it over and over or you can get up and dust yourself off and get back in that saddle. And you've got a choice to make. I mean, it's up to you. It's up to you. There's really only one right decision. Get back in that saddle. I remember when those cowboys would get thrown, sometimes they get thrown, sometimes they get caught up in a stampede and fall off their horse or their horse would be running and step in a gopher hole and they'd, they'd throw them. They'd be laying there on the ground and their buddies would come riding up and they'd jump off their horse and the first thing they would say to them was, can you ride? <laughs> remember that? Can you ride? Yeah, I believe I can ride. Well, good. That means I ain't got to tote you. Good. That means you ain't got to ride in the wagon with the women folk. Yeah, get it back on your horse. If there's a doctor somewhere, we'll find him. But you'd be doing us all a favor if you at least get back in the saddle and ride to the doctor on your own power in the horse. All I'm saying is this, many times I see Christians that they've been thrown for a loop for a variety of reasons and they just seem to lay there. Never can move past it, never can go on. Three reasons why you and I, when this happens to us, have to get back in the saddle, we have to. Number one, the reasons you were hurt ain't gonna last forever. Now stay with me just a second. Let's be honest. If you've been thrown off your horse, if you've, been, if you've been thrown for a loop, if you're laying in the dirt and you're bleeding and you're wounded and you're hurting, there's probably a pretty good explanation for it. I got tickled, Brother Dale Massingale, preacher friend of mine in McQuady, Kentucky. He's got horses. And he said, he got hurt real bad on a horse and he said he went somewhere and they said, they said, did you fall off your horse? He said, no, I did not fall off my horse. I got thrown off my horse. There is a difference. There's a difference. <laughs> Most people don't just fall off their horse. I remember one time I was on a horse, I was on a quarter horse, and that thing absolutely like, I mean, it was all I could do to hang on. I mean, that thing was wearing me out. I was screaming for help. Finally, the manager of Kmart came out there and unplugged it. And watch them quarter horses. That wasn't recently, by the way. That was a long time ago. <laughs> Let's be honest. Something or somebody knocked you down. It could have been your own fault. It could have been somebody else's. Bottom line is, you got hurt. One minute you're serving God, the next minute you're laying on the ground. And whatever it was that knocked you out of the saddle, whatever it was that caused you to fall doesn't have to define the rest of your life. That's what I'm trying to say. It doesn't have to determine the rest of your days. Dust yourself off and get back in the saddle. Our text says a just man falleth seven times and riseth again. That word just man, if you look it up in the Hebrew, it means lawful, righteous, a just man. That's literally what it means, a child of God, a righteous person, one of God's people. 
Rising up again is what God's people do when they've been cast down. That is a characteristic of God's people. When you fall down, you just get back up and you keep going. That phrase riseth up again in our text in Proverbs 24, 16, it literally means to arise, to stand. It means to endure. It means to persist. We live in a society today where people just quit so easily, give up so easily. No persistence, no drive, no ambition, nothing on the inside of them. They just sing that song, there's a fire burning within me. Jeremiah said in one place, he said, I decided I wasn't gonna preach anymore in his name. I was tired of the opposition, tired of the struggling, tired of having a broken heart and weeping and crying. I had made my mind up, I wasn't gonna preach anymore. He said, but I could not forbear. There was a fire in my bones. Something down deep inside motivated him to keep on going. Don't let what caused you to fall or stumble, don't let what caused you to get hurt, don't let what threw you out of the saddle define the rest of your life. David said in Psalm 119, 165, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. That word offend literally means a stumbling or a stumbling block or to fall. He said if you love God, if you're in love with God and the God, word of God, every little thing won't trip you up to start with. But if it does, it will not get the upper hand. In fact, David said this in another place in Psalm 119 and verse number 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. If you realize that God might have allowed you to go through that hurt, that pain, that suffering, just so he could teach you a little bit more about him and about his word and about how he operates. I know one thing, there's certain Bible verses in the Bible that meant a whole lot more to me after I was hurt than it did before. Hmm? So we see we should climb back in the saddle because the reasons you were hurt ain't forever. Number two, the roundup you were hired for ain't finished. Come on now. Come on now. That's a good point right there. We're in the middle of something big. We're in the middle of something important. And it's not finished. You don't have the luxury. I don't have the luxury to lay on the ground for the next five years and relive what happened and, 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 and get everybody around us and get our little group around us and let's talk about our boo-boo and talk about our, our, our sore, talk about all of our issues and how we got hurt and how this happened and this person did this to me and this happened and I didn't deserve this. We don't have time for that. There's work to be done. Thinking about Elijah when he was up under that juniper tree. <laughs> scared to death running from Jezebel remember that and God sent an angel made him some food he slept he rested and then God said you need to get back in the saddle I'm, I'm giving you the cowboy KJV version angel from the Lord said here eat these biscuits and beans get up off the ground Dust yourself off and get back in that saddle. Amen. There's stuff that's got to be done. And when you read that chapter, there were kings that needed to be appointed and anointed and installed. There was a young man by the name of Elisha plowing that needed a man of God to come by and throw a mantle on him and train him and mentor him for the next generation. Hey, sometimes you have to just go on because there's work to be done. I'm thinking about Romans chapter number 10, verse number 14, Paul said, how then shall they call on him of whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? I'm gonna say this as nice as I can. The cows ain't gonna drive themselves to the market. Right. Right. I heard, Brother Paul, are you with me? Remember those days when you was a cowboy back in the 1800s, remember that? Those cows are not going to drive their self to the stockade. Somebody's got to do it. Can I make an analogy? God has given the church the responsibility 
every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl, he has told us to bring them to God. You want to talk about a roundup. You want to talk about a humdinger of a mission. The whole world. Get them to God. Get them saved. That means you may have to go clear all the way down to the Philippines, Brother Nathan, to get it done. What am I saying? I'm saying you got to get back in the saddle. They're not going to get saved if we don't tell them. They're not going to hear the gospel if we're not involved, if we're not busy. We don't have the luxury when we get thrown out of the saddle just laying there. There's work to be done. We need every single born again believer to get back in the saddle and help us get these souls to God. And listen to me. If you want to sit down and tell me your story about when you got hurt, I'll listen. I'll weep with you. We'll go through a whole box of Kleenexes if you want to. Tell me about how you got, tell me about who did you wrong and when and where. And tell me all about it and I'll let you cry on my shoulder. But as soon as you get done and I get done crying, you know what I'm going to say to you? Get over it. That's what I'm going to say. You say, well, that's a little bit strong. I knew you were going to say that. That's why in Acts chapter number 14, I want to tell you about a man named Paul that got stoned and then drug out of the city and left for dead. And the Bible says that they stoned him in verse number 19 of Acts 14. Stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Preacher, I've been hurt. We all have. But I don't think there's a one of us in here that's had this happen. You won't talk about hurting. I was riding a motorcycle the other day and a little piece of gravel came off the road from the car in front of me and hit me in the face and it hurt. But I didn't sell my motorcycle. Come on now. Now I didn't get on the internet and rip everybody's face off that tried to get me to buy a motorcycle. I can't believe you talked me into this. I got hurt. I didn't go home and cry about it. I ain't told a soul about it until just now. What am I saying? Paul was stoned to death. Then drug out of town. Can we say it? He got thrown out of the saddle. But the story's not over. How be it, verse 20, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city. Which city? The city they just stoned him in. The city they just dragged him out of the city, thought he was dead, drug him outside of town like he was a piece of trash. Got up, the Bible says, rose up, came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe, and when he had preached the gospel of that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. They went to all these cities, and he did there exactly what he had been doing when he got stoned. Why? Because the roundup ain't finished. I wonder how many people... Well, let me give you a real-life illustration. I was going to give you a personal one. I got one better than that. What if, what if, what if in 2020, when Brother Don Boyd's wife died and he buried his wife and he was sitting in his office praying and a tree fell on him and broke his collarbone and gave him a concussion and they had to come in there with chainsaws and the fire department had to cut him out and take him to the hospital and his house wouldn't get fixed. The insurance company wouldn't let his house get fixed. And all of his books got ruined in the water and the rain. And he lost his whole house and had to move in to a little apartment with his, with his grandson. What if he had just said, I'm done. I've had all I can handle. Till one day he was at the doctor's office and got to witness him to Anna his therapist, and Anna got born again. 
And Anna went home and there was such a change in her life that her husband, Eric, who was the fire chief, he came to the doctor's office and he said when he found out Dr. Boyd was gonna be there, you gotta tell me what happened to my wife. She's changed. Whatever she's got, I gotta have it. And the ripple effect of that soul winning effort. And he said they had over 60 in there at the fire station Mother's Day. They've had 40 or 50 born again, saved by the grace of God. They're about to bury one of them that just got saved. What happened? He got knocked out of the saddle. That's what happened. He got knocked out of the saddle bigger than most of us could handle. But he said, I gotta get up and I gotta get back in the saddle because this roundup ain't over. People getting saved all the time. You think you got a reason to quit on God? I doubt it very seriously. Number three, let me give you one more. You smell that? And crock pots back there on warm. Now we have a don't ask, don't tell policy. If it's a Baptist casserole, don't ask what's in it, just eat it. You might not want to know what's in it. Number three, write this down. I've got to get back in the saddle because the reward you and I are hankering for ain't finalized. Now watch this right here. Those old cowboys, brother, brother Burner, they didn't get paid till the end of the drive. <laughs> Come on now. Now they got to eat. They got to eat and he took care of them on the trail. The trail boss did. But the arrangement was I'll pay you a dollar a day. You get paid at the end of the drive. You say, I'm just done. I'm, I'm, I'm going to quit. You can't do that. Payday's coming. There's crowns to be given out. There's rewards to be given out. Let me give you a verse. Listen to me now. Listen to me now. Second John chapter one, verse number eight, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. A lot of times those old cowboys would be tempted to leave the drive. They'd go through a town. They'd meet some pretty girl. They'd get a job offer from some other range boss and they'd, they'd have to make a decision. Am I gonna finish this drive or am I, gonna, am I gonna change streams, horses in the middle of the stream? And the boss would always look at him and say, you do what you want to, but you don't get paid till we finish this, till this herd gets to market, that's when you get paid. Can I tell you something? God will bless us down here. He'll take care of us down here. He'll meet our needs down here. But we don't get our rewards and our crowns till this thing is over with. And it's not over yet. I don't know about you, but I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things and I'll make you ruler over many. I want to hear him say that. He will only say, well done, thou good and faithful servant if we have been a faithful servant. The apostle Paul was highly, highly motivated yes. to finish what he started. Yes, sir. Here's what he said. In Acts chapter number 20, verse number 24, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Says a man that had been stoned, thrice beaten with rods, shipwrecked, spent a night and a day in the deep, perils of waters and perils of countrymen, perils of false brethren. Remember that long list? He said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. When he said in Acts 20, 24, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. When you quit, you never know how many people you could have touched, you could have helped, you could have ministered to, when you quit, you have no idea all the open doors that God could have opened up for you. When you quit, when you give up, when you throw up your hands and say, I've had all I can handle, I can't take it no more. You never experience the fullness of the blessings and the reward that God has for those that stay faithful. He said it again in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 7. I have fought a good fight. 
I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. He wrote that from prison, by the way. Prison. When Paul went to a new town, he didn't ask for the motel directory. He just went ahead and checked into jail. Because he's probably where he was going to spend the night. Or if he was giving out frequent flyer miles back then for jail time. How many times did he go to jail? How many times was he arrested? How many times did the devil give the apostle Paul an exit ramp to get off of the will of God? Paul said it like this in Romans 8, 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I don't know about you, but I don't care nothing about laying in the dirt the rest of my life, reminiscing about all the things that's happened to me and all the hurts and all the people that's done me wrong. I might ride in, listen to me, I might ride in at the end of this roundup covered with iodine and bandages and my arm in a sling, limping. But praise God, I want to get the pay at the end of this thing. You better believe it. Here's what he said in Hebrews 10, I'm finished. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 35 down through verse number 37. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, and after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise for yet a little while. And he that shall come shall come and will not tarry. When he comes back, and I believe he's coming. I just preached on that last week. He's coming. I don't want him find me crying in the dirt. I don't want him, I don't want him come back and me sit there writing a book about my boo-boo. And making excuses for why I couldn't do what God called me to do. When he comes back, I want to be found faithful, serving him, carrying on with some, with some, with some stickability. The just man falleth seven times, riseth back up again. That's what people of God do. They get back in the saddle. We got work to do. Some of y'all are sitting here this morning, and somewhere along the way, something happened to you. And it's almost like a defining event in your life of how you were before and how you've been since. I'm gonna say this as nicely as I can. You need to get over it. I'm not being cold hearted. I'm not being rude, I'm not being calloused. You need to move on. Put it behind you. Put it in your rear view mirror. Paul the apostle said, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things which are behind. God will help you. God will help you forget what happened. The joy of riding is a whole lot better than the pain of getting bucked off. Amen. The ministry hurt me. Somebody in church hurt me. A preacher hurt me. Tell me about it. I can write a whole series of books on the preachers that have hurt me, but I want to be found busy, laboring, serving, being faithful when Jesus comes back. Ask God to help you get over it and get back in the saddle. Father, we come to you this morning. Grateful, Lord, for the word of God, Lord, that challenges us and encourages us, Lord, to finish strong. Lord, reminds us of so many examples in the word of God of people, Lord, that were hurt, people, Lord, that were wounded, people that for some reason or another was thrown a curveball by Satan, and yet, Lord, through your strength and through your power, they were able to get up and dust herself off and keep going for God. There may be somebody in this service this morning, you need to just right now get up out of the seat and get an altar. Say, Lord, I pray that you'd help me. Help me deal with these things. Help me put these things to rest. Help me to just turn them over to you. And give me the strength, give me the grace, give me the courage that I need to just keep on going for God. Let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Please don't faint. Please don't quit. While we stand all over the church, folks are in the altar, heads bowed and eyes closed. I wonder, would there be somebody here this morning as we stand all over the building, would there be someone this morning that would raise their hand, say, Pastor Shiflet, pray for me. I'm not sure if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. I want you to pray for me. Would you be honest enough this morning to slip your hand up? Preacher, pray for me. Anybody, anywhere, anybody?
I see that hand. God bless you. At a baptism, you've got a few minutes to pray.